Dear class, welcome to lectures in international relations. Um, we're looking at realism and liberalism in IR, and we're basically expanding on what we learned in chapter one and two on these topics. Chapter two, as you know, focuses a lot on the history of Europe and the world wars, right? And also the Cold War period. So these histories become very important to understand developments in realism and also liberalism, okay, in international relations. So today's topics will look at world wars, one and two a little bit, we'll look at the Cold War. <clears throat> and essentially we're reflecting on what's happening in this era to understand this, the theoretical developments. So classical realism, as you remember, starts with Hobbes, right? Thomas Hobbes proposes the idea of anarchy and basically it's the lack of a world government, right? So there are other people who join in the debate in the 20th century. Let's take a look at who they are. So with the end of World War II, we know that millions of people die, countries are devastated. Two new superpowers, however, have emerged on the scene due to their atomic capabilities. The first is the US, and later you have the USSR. USSR develops its atomic bomb in 1945. And we see this sudden race to become more powerful. And we talked about the question of relative gains. So each of these superpowers starts to blame the other for the escalation of weapons race. During World War II, we see that the USSR acts in an uh, aggress aggressive fashion. Uh, within Europe. Um, it annexes the Baltic nations, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, also Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, Romania, parts of Austria, and sort of bullies them to uh, accept communist rule. And on the same side, you know, um, looking back in history, we see that the USSR had also annex annexed Finland at some point, right? We also see the US becoming very aggressive during the Cold War period. It expands its nuclear testing program in the Pacific. Um, and so we see that it's like dropping thousands of bombs in a small area to, to show off its nuclear power. And we'll, we'll look at that in more detail later. The US also starts a war in the Korean Peninsula. It forces the local leaders to give up any kind of decision-making power uh, when it comes to creating independent Korea. Instead, it wants to play a direct role in how Korea should be managed. This leads to a division between North Korea and South Korea, essentially, and a war breaks out. So the US also takes side in China, it starts giving money to the liberal parties in China, which is the Kuomintang, and against the Maoists, who are the communists. In Vietnam, the US ignores uh, its friend, Ho Chi Minh, who is actually in the northern part of Vietnam. Ho Chi Minh is asking for help because the French have colonized Vietnam you know, since the 1800s, and we'll talk about that another time as well. And they're refusing to leave, and they've taken side with the, they've created this puppet government essentially in South Vietnam. And Ho Chi Minh wants the US to intervene on the side of Vietnam to free them, but instead the US decides to just follow whatever the French are doing, and at some point it it displaces the Vietnamese. So we see this very political time. Also in Europe, the USSR is dividing Berlin, building this wall. Actually, the division is actually agreed to by 
the US, UK, France, and you know, uh, Russia at the time, but they decide, the Soviets decide to build a wall uh, to create a real border between the East Berlin and West Berlin. Uh, in Europe, we also see the development of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which is for the Western European countries, Canada, US, uh, Korea, Japan, they also join in as you saw that. And in the East, a Warsaw Pact among USSR and Eastern European nations is formed. So we see this big kind of power struggle going on. It's, it's a cold war because no direct war is being fought among the Western nations. We see this basically a race, a weapons race going on, right? And each side is concerned that they have to stop the other side from making more allies around the planet which we see in the domino effect. So the US starts all these wars around the planet just to stop the Soviet Union from becoming uh, a strong ally of other nations. We call this the domino effect, right? We're trying to stop the domino effect. So all of this is creating a very tense situation. Now the Soviets and the US suddenly look at each other and say, look, this is not going to be a good thing for us. We're heading towards a direction of mutually assured destruction. At one point, somebody is going to detonate a nuclear weapon on each other, and it's going to be over. So they decide to de-escalate the conflict, and they engage in all kinds of steps to reduce the number of nuclear warheads, and other kinds of warheads. And they start creating treaties such as the SALT I and II treaties, right? So the Cold War also leads to, uh, a, 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 it's an era during which colonialism ends, right? We see that the British, French, Dutch all leave their colonies. And there's nationalism. So what kind of theories can evolve from this time? So looking at World War One, Woodrow Wilson is telling the world that basically he's talking to Europe and saying, here are my 14 point demands. One of them is that Europe must allow its colonies the right to self-determination. And in 1940s, Franklin Roosevelt after World War II is one says the same thing. He looks at Churchill and the French all over Asia and Africa. And he says, you, not, you need to pack up your bags and leave the colonies. So this support is needed from the US in the, in, uh, for the other nations to become free because the US is a nuclear superpower. It actually is, uh, is able to achieve this diplomatic move. Instantly, the British, the French, and the Dutch and others leave Asia and Africa. And it's also able to do this because it has the support of the USSR, right? You have Stalin, you have also the Chinese leader of the time in the 1940s, Chiang Kai-shek, who is the leader of the liberal political party, the Kuomintang, they all agree with FDR and say, yes, colonialism is horrible, it needs to end. Now the realists are responding to these kinds of liberal ideas of creating free countries, you know, getting rid of empires, and belief in uh, the right to self-determination, right? And in the 1930s, E.H. Carr is a realist and he's calling out Woodrow Wilson for his 14 point demand speech and says, look, Wilson is just pretending to be a liberal. Actually, this is a realist move. The US wants to become the next hegemon 
And that's why it's asking the French and the British to get out of Asia and Africa. But liberals like Wilson will say no. We actually believe in the idea of liberalism. Immanuel Kant is basically you know, creating this idea and we'll look at it. And so the liberals say that, no, there is something called human goodness. And we think that if we follow these kinds of ideals, we can change the world. We just need a federation of states or some kind of governance at the international level. So let's try with the League of Nations. So obviously, as you saw with World War II, the League of Nations was a major failure. What's Kant's idea? So Kant essentially writes this book called Perpetual Peace and proposes that humans are actually generally good. And this is an idea that Hobbes also has, right? He says, most people are risk averse. They're not going to challenge the sovereign, right? That's what Hobbes says. And Kant says the same thing about human nature. Most people are good. Peace is productive. So this is Kant's big argument. He said, why should we have peace? Because peace is productive. Our wealth multiplies through trade, aid, cultural exchange, all of that, right? So if you have trade, investment, all of these things, countries can become wealthy. And so why should they want war? And so Kant realizes that war still happens, just like Hobbes proposes, because there's anarchy in the international system. There's no government, right? No government at the international system. So Kant says, let's have cooperation among states. Let's create a federation of states. So once you create the federation, war must stop, right? Because you'll have diplomacy among the states, they'll create rules and some, you know, they will be able to avert the selfish type of war. So in the 1940s, at the end of World War II, you see this kind of Kantian influence in politics. The creation of the United Nations basically is this big international governing body with lots of laws. And the members are all these independent states that come together and have discussions, right? So FDR and Wilson both propose creating liberal uh, governing body at the international level, but also the right of self-determination and the United Nations is promising you that. It also seeks to address real disputes inside the UN Security Council. E.H. Carr was saying that, look, the League of Nations failed because it did not really address the issue that you know, is staring you in the face after World War I, which is the general unhappiness of Germany, and the same time Germany's rising power. So now the United Nations Security Council is supposed to give voice to those kinds of real disputes. However, if you look at the history of the Security Council, and we will, it will see. It seems like that these are the countries that are unable to actually figure out how to create peace, and they're constantly going to war with each other. Looking back at the United Nations and other international governing bodies, however, in the you know nineteen nineties or nineteen eighties, certain kinds of new kinds of theories are being proposed. Kyohin and I is one of them. These are the neoliberal institutionalists. And they're drawing focus to the idea that institutions give states norms, rules, and values to follow, right? These are leading to states cooperating with each other on many issue areas. So they can't really start fighting because they're cooperating on, say, human rights issues, environmental issues, trade, aid, all kinds of things. So Kyohin and I call this situation a complex interdependence. But they're also saying that it's not just the states, there's also 
international governing bodies, which are important in the international level. You have non-governmental institutions, corporations, even people's movements. And they draw focus to the crisis of the oil shock, right? Oil price shock in 1973, where you have OPEC nations, you know, becoming a cartel and deciding to increase the price of oil uh, against the West, right? So Western economies are now affected by this. And Kuhin and I say, there's a lesson here. Other actors can be equally important in international relations. They're having real impacts on different economies in the world. And so we need to start paying attention to non-governmental organizations, to corporations, cartels, and social movements, right? Lastly, you have Andrew Moravchik who says, look, corporations, individuals, these kinds of groups are also important in national politics. So if you want to understand state interests, you have to start paying attention to how these entities are forming state interests. So let's stop here. And next time we'll talk about constructivism.